Welcome to the Deep Dive. We're here to cut through the noise and give you the insights that matter. That's right. Today, our focus is squarely on Navitas Semiconductor. <laughs> uh, ticker NVTS. Yes. And we've got a real conflict to unpack. Is Navitas fundamentally building the future, you know, especially with AI? Or is it just caught up in the hype, priced way too high? It really is the narrative versus the numbers, isn't it? I mean, you look at the stock price recently, closed at $12.57. Right. But here's the kicker, the real conflict. Your standard fundamental analysis, Wall Street consensus, they put the value much lower, like maybe 6 or $7. Wow, that's that's basically half. Exactly. So yeah. why is the market paying double? That's what you need to understand. And we can pinpoint almost the exact moment things went wild. Around mid-October, the stock just leaped. Went from about $8 and some three cents up to uh, $13.33. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't earnings, it was news, a strategic partnership. Navitas announced its tech is going into NVIDIA's next-gen 800-volt AI data centers, the AI factory, they're calling it. And that validation, that single announcement, it just completely shifted market perception overnight. So let's dive in. Let's unpack what's really going on behind that headline. Let's do it. Chapter one, business understanding. Okay, first off, you need to get that Navitas isn't your dad's silicon company. They're not playing that game. Uh -huh. Their chips use these next generation materials, wide band gap stuff. Gallium nitride, they call it, GANFAST, and silicon carbide. Uh, Genesi Sidel. Okay, Gana Sinesi. What's the actual advantage? Why does it matter? Well, it boils down to superior physics, really. These materials let the chips handle huge amounts of power much more efficiently. Less energy wasted as heat. Uh, okay. Which is absolutely critical for things like AI data centers, you know, or the new 800 volt EV systems. Right. So you get faster charging, higher power density, meaning smaller, lighter devices, and big energy savings. Less heat means less need for cooling. Got it. Smaller, faster, cooler, and their business model. It's fabulous. So they focus all their energy, their capital, on the design, the R&D, building that IP portfolio. Yeah. They've got over 300 patents now. Impressive. Yeah. And they outsource the actual manufacturing, the really expensive part, to foundries like PowerChip. Keeps things capital light. Okay. But here's where it gets interesting, right? Mm. The strategic shift. They made a name for themselves in mobile fast chargers. I got into basically every major phone maker. 10 out of the top 10 OEMs, yeah. Yeah. Huge volume. But now they're moving away from that. Intentionally, yes. Management is deliberately shifting focus away from that high volume, but ultimately lower margin mobile business. Okay. Where are they pivoting to? Higher power, higher margin applications. Think electric vehicles, solar power infrastructure, industrial systems, and the big one right now. AI data centers, that's the target. Makes sense on paper, follow the money. And that market, the CC and GAN power semi-market, it's just exploding. Projections are like 20% to 30% compound annual growth over the next decade, driven by electrification, by AI needing more and more power. So huge potential. Yeah. But they're not alone, are they? Who are they up against? Oh, definitely not alone. You've got competitors like WolfSpeed plus the established giants, Infineon, STMicro, they're all in this space. Right. But a key trend, something you need to watch, is consolidation. M&A activity, like Infineon buying GAN systems recently. Yeah. That validates the tech, shows it's critical. And it kind of puts a spotlight on Navitas, too. Hmm. Suggests they could be an attractive takeover target themselves down the line. Interesting angle. So the tech is hot, the market's growing, but this pivot is huge. Who's steering the ship? Good question. Let's talk about that. Chapter 2. Management evaluation. This is pretty crucial. There's new leadership. Chris Alexander took over as president and CEO uh, September 1st, 2025. Okay. New CEO. What's his background? Highly relevant. He's a 25-year semiconductor veteran. Comes from Renisa's IDT, NXP, Texas Instruments. Big names. Okay. Solid experience. But here's the really interesting part. His last role, he ran a $2.5 billion power division. And get this. He actually directed the acquisition and integration of Transform. Wait, Transform? The Gannon competitor. A very same. So he's literally executed the kind of strategic integration playbook that Navitas needs right now. He knows the challenges involved. Wow, okay. That's that's quite specific experience. Yeah. Seems like a good fit for this pivot. It certainly looks that way. And you see decisiveness, too. Remember that 19% workforce reduction back in 2024, 2025? Yeah, that was significant. Tough call, right? But it was necessary to align their costs with this new strategic direction, moving away from the lower margin mobile stuff, shows they're willing to make hard choices. And how are they managing their money, capital allocation? 
It's classic high growth strategy. No dividend, no share buybacks. Every spare dollar is going back into R&D, funding that future growth. Makes sense for where they are. And they were smart. They raised about $100 million through equity offerings, bolstered the balance sheet, <laughs> gave themselves a pretty substantial cash runway to actually execute this transition. So they have the cash to try. What about efficiency, return on invested capital? Ah, well, here's where you see the investment phase clearly. The TTM ROIC, it's deeply negative, minus 17.1%. Ouch. Minus 17%. Yeah, it sounds bad on the surface, doesn't it? But you have to contextualize it. For a company at this stage, basically pre-profitability, pouring money into R&D for future payoffs, negative RIC is kind of expected. Right. They're spending money to hopefully make much more later, like a venture investment. Exactly. If they were highly profitable right now, you might almost worry they weren't investing enough in innovation to keep up. Okay, so... Management seems capable of making tough calls, got the cash runway, but let's see the impact on the actual financials. What do the numbers say today? Let's dig in. Chapter three, financial analysis. All right. Market cap is sitting around $2.68 billion. Substantial. The revenue picture, it's a bit of a paradox. You really need to grasp this. Growth was explosive up until 2023. Mm. Then, a sharp slowdown in 2024, only 4.8% year-over-year growth, and the trailing 12 months. Revenue actually declined by 25.7%, down to $68.17 million. Okay, hold on. Explosive growth, then slam on the brakes, now declining. How does that fit the AI hype story? Because that decline is intentional. It's a direct result of them strategically deprioritizing that lower margin mobile business we talked about. Ah, uh, right. They're choosing to shrink that part. Exactly. Management even guided for a pretty weak Q3 revenue, only $10 million. So if you're looking at this, you have to focus on the future revenue mix, not the current negative growth. The market is pricing this based on tomorrow, not today. Got it. Trading on the promise, what about profitability? Predictable, given the investment. TTM net profit margin is, uh, well, it's minus 182.6%. Minus 182%. Yeah. And consistent negative free cash flow. They're burning cash about $50.5 million over the last 12 months. That's the cost of the pivot and the R&D. What about gross margin? Any sign of improvement there? The non-GAAP gross margin was about 38.5% in Q2. Management sees that as the floor. Their long-term target is over 50%, which they need to hit if the pivot works. Okay, so burning cash, negative margins, mm. but they raise money. How's the balance sheet? This is the big positive. The financial strengths, the safety net, it's pristine. They have $161.2 million in cash All right. and virtually zero debt. Debt to equity ratio is negligible, like 0 0.02. The current ratio, measuring liquidity, is super healthy at 8.23. So they have the cash cushion to weather this storm, to fund the burn, while they try to execute. Absolutely. They've got plenty of runway. All right. Initial valuation look. P.E. is meaningless with negative earnings, but price to sale. Yeah, the P.S. ratio is, well, it's extremely high, 39.3. 39 times sales. How does that compare? Get this. Even AI giant NVIDIA running red hot has a PS around 34.5. So Navitas is trading at a higher sales multiple than NVIDIA right now. Correct. That number screams sky high market expectations. It's telling you the market has already priced in years of flawless high growth execution. Absolutely zero margin for error baked in. That NVIDIA partnership news really lit a fire under it, which brings us nicely to market perception after four market sentiment. Yeah, the disconnect between the market and the analysts is, well, stark. Stock's at $12.57, yeah, right? Yeah. The average analyst price target is way down, somewhere between $6.24 and maybe $7.10. That's a huge gap. It really is. It just signals that the market enthusiasm, mostly fueled by that NVIDIA news, has just run miles ahead of what the traditional financial models can justify right now. And the media coverage. Oh, overwhelmingly positive. Euphoric, even. Headlines like skyrocketing, rockets 30%. It's all hype driving that price action. Which creates volatility. And what about short sellers or people betting against this? Definitely. The short interest is high. Depending on the source, it's between, say, 25.6% and 30.4% of the public float. Wow. A quarter to a third of the float. Yeah. That's a significant chunk. Represents a pretty uh -huh. strong bearish conviction from some corners of the market. But It's also fuel for a squeeze, right? Exactly. If more positive news drops, those shorts could be forced to cover, pushing the price even higher, faster. It adds another layer of volatility. And technically. 
from a charting perspective. Very strong momentum. The stock is trading way above both its 50-day moving average, which is around $6.85, and its 200-day down at $4.66. So the trend is clearly up, technically speaking. Absolutely. The narrative is firmly in the driver's seat right now. Okay, so the market's hyped. Analysts are skeptical. Shorts are circling. Who actually owns this thing? Good question. Let's look inside. Chapter 5. Ownership Structure. All right, the breakdown is interesting. Institutions think big players like Vanguard, BlackRock, they hold a significant chump, around 42 to 44%. Okay, the usual suspects. And insiders, the management, the board, they own about 26%. That's quite high, actually shows they have skin in the game. 26% is substantial. But what about the hedge funds, the so-called smart money? Are they buying the story? Well, this is where it gets really telling. There's a split decision. On one side, you have funds like Renaissance Technologies, Millennium Management. They either started new positions or added significantly in Q2 2025. They're betting on the narrative. Okay. But yeah. on the other side, you have 0.72 Asset Management. Big name. They completely sold out, liquidated their entire stake in that same quarter. Whoa. So the hedge funds are completely divided. No consensus there. None at all. Which makes the insider actions even more critical to look at. Uh-huh. What are they doing? the people running the company. This is the big red flag, potentially. You really have to pay attention here. In the last six months, 51 sales transactions by insiders. 51 versus how many buys? One, just one purchase. 51 sales versus one buy. That's, yeah. that's pretty unambiguous. It's concerning, isn't it? You see names like director Brian Long, director Ron Beersing, selling significant volumes, especially into this recent price surge after the NVIDIA news. So while the market is bidding the stock up on future promise, the people who know the company best are heading for the exits. It certainly looks that way. Now, they might just be diversifying, taking some profits after a big run-up. That's always possible. Or they might think the current price is ahead of reality at least for the near term. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It creates this real tension between the outside perception and the inside actions. Definitely something to weigh heavily. Yeah. Okay, let's pull together the risks. Right, time for the reality check. Chapter six, risk assessment. Okay, let's summarize the bull case foundation first. The strengths are obvious, right? Yeah, the technology leadership seems clear with all those patents. Yeah. The fabulous model is smart, capital efficient. And that NVIDIA validation, you can't overstate how important that is for market perception right now. Those are the pillars of the bull argument. But the bear case, the risks. They are severe. And the single biggest one, the elephant in the room, is geopolitical. Concentration risk. China. China. 62%. 62% of their Q2 2025 revenue came directly from China. Over half their business. Yes. So imagine if the U.S.-China trade war escalates further. If new tariffs come in, say 100% tariffs on semiconductors or related tech. That 62% doesn't just get squeezed. It could get wiped out almost overnight. That is a massive, potentially existential threat hanging over this stock. It's the number one risk, period. Okay, huge geopolitical risk. What else? Execution risk. We talked about the pivot moving into AI, EV, industrial. It's complex. They're up against huge entrenched competitors. Oh, yeah. Winning those design cycles isn't easy. It takes time. It takes flawless execution. There's no guarantee they succeed. Right. The pivot isn't a done deal. Not at all. And then you have macro factors. High interest rates are poison for stocks like this high growth burning cash. It increases their cost of capital, makes future projected earnings less valuable today. And a stock's volatile anyway, right? Yeah. What was the beta? Right. High. 3.03. Meaning it swings much more wildly than the overall market. So any market downturn is going to hit NBTS extra hard. Okay. So significant risks. China, execution, macro. Let's try and bring it all together. All right. Final chapter. Chapter 7. Conclusion. So we've laid it all out. You've got this powerful, almost seductive narrative on one side. Yeah. The essential tech, the Gansic advantage, the massive AI and EV tailwinds, the new CEO with that specific experience, and crucially, that rock-solid balance sheet. It's compelling. Very compelling. But then you stack it up against the reality. Which is constrained valuation, right? Yeah. That PS ratio higher than NVIDIA. Significant ongoing cash burn, the massive unavoidable China risk, mm -hmm. and maybe most tellingly, that pattern of heavy insider selling. Exactly. And when we try to ground this in fundamentals, using a discounted cash flow model, even being really aggressive with the assumptions. I aggress. Like assuming 45% annual revenue growth for the next five years straight, which is yeah. huge, and using a high discount rate, 16% because of the risk. Even with those rosy assumptions, what, 
what does the DCF say? The estimated intrinsic value range still only comes out between roughly $5.50 and $8 per share. Wait, let me get this straight. Best case, aggressive growth. The fundamental value is maybe $8, and the stock is trading at $12.57. That's the disconnect. The gap is enormous. It tells you unequivocally that the current share price isn't based on current financial reality or even optimistic, fundamentally grounded future projections. So what is it based on? Sentiment, narrative, hope. It's a bet purely on the NVIDIA story continuing and on Navitas executing absolutely flawlessly in these new high margin markets for years to come. So investing now. Investing in NVTS at this $12.57 price point. It's a high risk, high potential reward narrative play. It is absolutely not a traditional value investment based on the numbers today. Which leaves us with that final provocative thought, especially considering the insider selling alongside this market euphoria. Yep. Are the company leaders just prudently diversifying their personal wealth after a fantastic run-up? Or are they quietly signaling that they think this price right now might be the high watermark, at least for the foreseeable future? Something for you to definitely mull over as you weigh that compelling narrative against the hard numbers. We hope this deep dive helped bring some clarity to Navitas Semiconductor. Indeed, a fascinating case study in today's market. And if you found this helpful, consider liking and subscribing to Stock Analytics AI. We dive deep like this all the time. Absolutely. And remember, for just $4.99 a month, you get access to our full playlist. That's 500 deep dive videos covering every single stock in the S&P 500. Plus, coming up next, exclusively for our members, we're tackling the entire NASDAQ 100. And members, don't forget you can request specific deep dives. Just drop the ticker symbol in the comments and we'll get on it for you. And one last thing, the standard but important disclaimer. This analysis was generated by an AI system. It's for educational and informational purposes only. It is absolutely not financial advice. Please, always do your own research before making any investment decisions.